So we're here talking about um, DV DSLRs, uh, in particular this 1DC. I'm going to try and show as much footage as I can, because it's way more interesting than listening to me talk, but I will uh, talk as much as I can. Um, I'll be answering questions, but only in like four or five minutes, because it's a 45-minute presentation. We have started a little bit late, but I will still go for 45 minutes, I understand. And then I'll be downstairs on the cannon stand in front of the C500, where you can ask as many questions as you want. So um, that buzzing is interesting. Is that, could we get rid of that? Nah, it's fine. You'll all get used to it eventually. So hi, nice to see you all here. Having a nice BVE? We're just going to do introductions first, so I know where everybody's from. Just give me like a minute of where you're from, what you do, um, you know, just something nice, what your favorite color is. So we'll start with you, sir. No, I'm joking. We haven't got time for that. Um, <laughs> Your name's Philip? Yes, please. Perfect. You can have my 1DC. <laughs> um, who here shot with a DSLR on a... When I say professional production, I mean one that you got paid for or invoiced for, but maybe never got paid for. <laughs> who never got paid for one? Yeah. We've all been there, haven't we? Who here sh shot with a DSLR for fun? Which can also be paid for, hopefully, if you're lucky. Who here has never shot with a DSLR in their life before? Ever, ever, ever. Who here has never shot a frame of video in their life before? Who here should be at the show down the corner, <laughs> which is the Victoria's Secret lingerie show? <laughs> at this point, everybody leaves. <laughs> right, okay, well, it's fairly common because they've been around for quite a while now. Everybody know when the Mark II uh, came out and Vincent uh, Laforet, Vincent Laforet, the reverie, came out? Which month? Which one? No, it's November. Close. Very close. Well done. So it's been around a fair old time. That makes it not quite four and a half years, but four years and almost three and a half months. And that kind of surprised me when I actually looked back and went, wow, that's quite a long time. Uh, since then, we've seen it on a lot of um, professional productions. Because it was small, it gave us great images, which prior to this, we simply weren't able to achieve on anywhere near to this sort of budget. And for me, that was the key thing. Uh, anybody here mess around with 35mm adapters? See, you've had fun. The journey's been fun. Um, I spent my entire life shooting video. Uh, seven, sort of first 12 years was on the uh, was on um, Bidicam SP, then uh, then uh, Bidicam SX, Digi Beta. So big heavy cameras like you, but you're on a tripod, so you're not you're not worried, are you? It's fine. And um, like everybody else who did what I did, I no longer have a fully functioning back. So I love the idea of small cameras. Love the idea of cameras which give me 35 millimeter optics and a pretty damn good film look. So these productions were you know, quite well known for using uh, DSLRs. Obviously House did a whole season finale using it, which was nuts. Um, Saturday Night Live um, basically stole my uh, Dublin's People idea for their opening sequence, which was deliberate though. They actually asked me, can we use this? And I went, yeah, sure, can I shoot it? And they went, no. <laughs> But I'm really good friends with a DP, so it doesn't matter so much. He, he did a better job than me, anyway. Um, and Red Tails is what I, um, I was involved with. And that was, my god, that was, it'll be three years ago this month. That just takes me back how long ago it was. And um, anybody know what my credit is in that movie? Huh? Director? What's the director? No? Starring? No? It's 5D Mark II cinematographer. <laughs> Fantastic. What a specific credit. I love it. It's brilliant, isn't it? You don't have that for anything else, do you? You don't have Ari Alexa cinematographer or Red Epic cinematographer. You just have, and it, it's lovely. I mean, it was an amazing experience working on that. And, you know, it was working with um, Lucasfilm, working with Rick McCallum, great producer, and also having George Lucas actually frame up my shots. And as I was um, operating the cam uh, camera and had first AC and second AC, I actually had George Lucas actually tweak the tripod, change the framing, and that left me nothing to do because <laughs> the first AC would do focus and hit record on, on the actual um, the remote follow focus. So it was like, <laughs> yeah. And George would be like, that's good. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> You're not going to say. <laughs> Bit less headroom, George. Um, I know you're leaving a bit of space to put a CGI alien in there, but it's not really going to work. Um, so it was wonderful shooting on that, an amazing experience. And I'm just going to show you very quickly, uh, I'm going to sum up in three and a half minutes my life with DSLRs. It's not 
all my, my best staff, but as much as I could squeeze in three and a half minutes, the lovely Sarah at the front there wearing blue. Wave, Sarah. Yay. She cut this for me. She had to cut this for me. If I cut it, it would be around nine and a half hours long. <laughs> you need perspective. So I'm going to play this for you. This is When Kill the Lights. This is the highlights of my DSLR years. <laughs> Help me get drunk. Help me get drunk. Dang a bell, dang a bell. Help me get drunk today. Support your local wino. Help me go to the liquor store. I was, I was squeezing my banana all the way through there. Um, it's nice to see my life of four years summed up in three and a half minutes. Um, some lovely shots in there. I think one of my favorites is probably the reason why they recast Spider Man. Toby Maguire let himself go. Um, <laughs> overweight, middle-aged Spider-Man. Um, actually, two of those shots I didn't actually shoot, I didn't tell you. Some of the nicer ones shot by my B cameraman. And a couple of shots that Danielle, remember, from uh, Tuscany. Take you back? Best job ever, wasn't it? Anyway, so um, shot loads of different things, documentaries, commercials, features, um, fun stuff. And just honestly, the joy of shooting with, with the DSLR it was, I'm sure a lot of people have the same opinion. It's just, it was just a wonderful experience. Um, I stopped using them. Why? Why did I stop using them? And why did so many other people stop using them? Anybody know? Nobody knows. C300 still. Hmm? C300, what else? Huh? Nah, that's not been fixed. Uh, anybody else? Nah, it's bigger than that. You got it right with C300, but it's bigger than that. It's, 
camera manufacturers responded and brought out video cameras with larger sensors, which basically got past pretty much most of the issues, not the rolling shutter, um, that the DSLRs had. One of the key things would be audio, monitoring, and all that sort of focuses. So those things that we basically just adjusted to and got over, you know, initially when you use a DSLR, you're like, Ugh. especially if you come from an ENG camera, you're like, hang on a minute, where's my viewfinder? Hang on a minute, where's my headphone jack? Hang on a minute, where's my zebras? Where's, my, where's the ability to bring up my, my peaking? None of that was there. You got used to it because you loved the image and you, you, uh, you accepted the compromises because the positives were so, so, so much better. These large sensor camcorders really changed everything and simply, um, I got, I think the first one I got was in 2000 and, what are we year? 2013. It must have been around the end of 2011. Um, I'm not going to say the brand of the camera, but the first one I got was, a, it was a company that uh, rhymes with um, Tanasonic. Um, I won't <laughs> tell you which one it is. Um, I got one of their cameras, and then I, I moved on to um, a, a camera from a manufacturer that rhymes with Boney. And um, loved them all, great cameras. And then Canon came out of C300. And for me, it just summed it all up for me. It was like, it was small, which is what I loved. It, I could shoot without a rig. I hate shooting with rigs. The best camera in the world is that. What is that? PMW 500. PMW 500, Sony XD camera, right? Lovely camera. Sits on your shoulder. Do you need a rig with that? No. It's ergonomic. No DSLR is ergonomic. None of these other cameras are ergonomic. C300. It came out of the box, viewfinder, lens, battery, card, shoot with it, no rig. And that was a godsend. And it was also, it operated the same sort of way. There's other cameras to change ISOs, you're flicking through menus and stuff. This, it just operated almost by touch, not quite as easy. But for me, this camera was my answer. And I, as soon as I got this, which would have been sort of March last year, I didn't touch a DSLR apart from for time lapse and for taking stills which is key. doesn't take stills. Um, but I use it in lots of productions, the Adidas Spiral, some uh, corporate, some um, fiction pieces. use it for loads and loads of different things. And it has absolutely become the number one. It's basically the DigiBeta of 2013. It's what loads of productions are using now because it's a beautiful image, really easy to use, a codec which is accepted by broadcasters. So I stopped using DSLRs. And it, is, it was sad because... I love DSLRs, but there was no reason to use it. Why would you use a lesser tool when you had a better tool? It makes no sense. But then something happened. I had the return of the DSLR into my life. And anybody know what camera brought me back into the fold? Yeah. How do you know that? The 1DX. One of the reasons I love about the 1DX is it's just so well made, really well made. Um, <laughs> Weather sealed, as long as you've got a rubber seal on the lens, it's, a, a, it's relatively big compared to, say, a 5D, but I just love the fact that it's... The thing about DSLRs, I need to put my stress banana down. Um, everything's at a touch. You've got, you know, you've got your ISO, you've got your, your white balance, and it's all literally... That you can change all of your settings within two fingers. And that means I just shoot. I'm not looking at the side saying, how do I change my shutter speed? That one, and then that one. And that's what a lot of these cameras do. I, what, I shoot a lot of documentaries, and a lot of it is very fast moving. Now, if you're working on a, a feature, and you have more time, and you have somebody who's doing that for you, you don't care. But if you're running around trying to shoot stuff, you want to be quick and nimble. And this is quick and nimble. But what made the 5D3 I got I liked it, but it felt like it lacked something special about it, the image-wise. It was a massive improvement over the Mark II. But when I got my hands on this, uh, I just fell in love with the image. The image, it was something very organic about it. I'm not quite sure what it was, but I, I, I went and shot a music video with it, um, which is a couple of still frames of me operating it. I had a, a massive crew on this um, of me. That's me there. Um, I seem to spend a lot of time on the floor. That's the downside to all these cameras which have weather sealing. They don't have the flip-out screen. So you end up sort of like lying on the ground a lot. I was in Brussels last week doing the same thing. I spent, I should, maybe I should just bring like a yoga mat with me or something just to lie down or a blanket. That's Ollie Knights. We're going to touch on the music video that he did in a minute. And this is just me operating here. All tripod based. Um, and then I shot... The other thing, probably my favourite thing I shot with the uh, 1DX was a documentary in South Africa. In, on safari, 
Everything I shot on the 1DX was handheld. Every single frame. There were some tripod shots uh, from a, a separate camera, but 90% of what you saw in this documentary was the 1DX. Loved it. One lens, 24 to 105 IS. I always use IS lenses handheld on the DSLR because of the rolling shutter. It makes a huge difference. And I love the image. Just kill the lights and I'll take, show you two tiny little sections of both of these. There should be sound on that. Just pump up the sound if there is. Or did I not give it to you? There we go. It's easy to romanticize your past. I only want to leave a thing that lasts. Time will pass. Surely will. Absolutely adored shooting with the cameras, that immediacy. And I was in the back of a Land Rover for two days, just literally grabbing everything, hopping over the front of the seat Land Rover to get tight shots. And then on the opening shot, I had a, um, a little tripod that um, our tracker was using, and it was holding it to give that effect of like um, a body cam. Just adored the image so much. But to be honest with you, it was a completely non-essential purchase because I will not use the 1DX for broadcast work because it's not being approved unless you use an external recorder, but it has no clean HDMI out. So this is a tool for personal stuff, for taking great stills, but never for actual proper broadcast work. Web work, fine. So it never actually made any sense. And I was, given, I was obviously given grief by certain people for buying it. Um, hi. Um, <laughs> why'd you buy it? I like the image. Yeah, but did you need it? No, not really. <laughs> what are you going to use it for? Are you getting any paid work from it? Probably not. <laughs> so, but I still loved it. You know what it's like? It's, it just sung. The image just sung for me, and I just loved it. But then this, this was actually announced in, God, this was announced ages ago, November 2011. Maybe the Panasonic was, oops, Panasonic was 10. I get really confused with the years. Everything sort of merged into one. The 1DC was announced um, at the same time as C300. Didn't know much about it. DSLR with a C on it. And I knew it was going to be 4K. To be honest with you, who here has ever shot 4K? OK, keep your hands up if you have delivered in 4K. You have? What'd you do? Perfect. So that's really about it. Anybody here got a 4K TV? I'm hoping to see some hands from somebody super, super rich. I was going to have a chat with you. No? <laughs> this is the only time I've ever seen my work in 4K. You haven't seen it yet. It's the first time I've seen it. At home, editing it, the only way I've been able to see 4K is by putting it full screen on my retina and having it, watching a corner of it, and then watching another corner of it, and then watching the bottom corner of it, and trying to piece it together in my mind. So, ah, oh, that's what it's going to look like. I don't have a way of seeing it, so it makes no sense for me, generally. I, I owned um, a very expensive 4K camera, didn't I, John, um, for a while. And it's a beautiful camera. It's a movie camera. And most of my work is documentary, and very rarely with crews. So it actually, in the end, I, I didn't keep it. But everything I shot with it, two thirds of what I shot with that 4K camera uh, went to SD. And I think the rest of it either went to the web or it went to HD, but that was it. Nobody ever, I nev it never went to 4K. And I was like, why am I bothering? Why am I going through the hell of shooting 4K? So the idea of another 4K camera made no sense to me. 4K for me makes sense is when I go into Tesco's to pick up a bag of lettuce and a pint of milk, and they have the 4K TV from LG that costs 250 quid. That's when 4K is going to be huge. Will that ever happen? Of course it will. But my, my barometer of whether we need 4K is actually my family, is my sister. My sister has a lovely HD TV. She has a DVD player underneath it. I said, Nat, you've got a lovely TV. Why are you playing standard definition DVDs into it? And she says, can't tell the difference. <laughs> For me, that sums it up. 
obviously that's different. If it was a professional, you will see a huge difference. So anyway, 1DC. The cost was one of the biggest things. A very expensive camera for a DSLR, isn't it? It's like 10 times more expensive than a, a 600, 60D, I guess. Is that about right? Something like that. It's a lot of money. I already had a 1DX at that point and a 5D Mark III, two 5D Mark III's, and um, a C300, which I use 90% of my work because it's lovely. Lovely image, wonderful. So it made absolutely no sense. Oh, I had no interest in it whatsoever. Also, no 25p, a bit useless for Europe because we need that frame rate for um, most of the world, in fact, is 25p. It's just a couple of countries in Asia, Northern America, and a few down the side of South America and Central America. Everybody else is 50i. So it didn't make any sense. Coming in April, though, thankfully, which was actually one of the key reasons why I got interested in it, knowing that was coming. The, uh, it's not full frame in 4K. It's APS-C, APS-H, which is the same as 1D Mark IV, and also the same as the 5K mode in the Red Epic. So it's, it's still a very nice size image, but it's still a DSLR. Biggest issues with DSLR, by far, is audio. Audio in it is no good. You have to record externally. Not a big deal if you're shooting fiction, you always do that anyway, but for documentaries, it's a pain. Victoria, isn't it a pain? Right, okay. That's why you bought C300, right? There we go. 8-bit recording. 8-bit can work because the C300's 8-bit is beautiful. You very rarely see banding. It looks really terrific. I was worried about it being in 4K. I was worried about motion JPEG. I was worried about the fact that 30 minutes equals 128 gigabytes. I was worried that 128 gigabyte card with the speed that's needed for that costs around 650 pounds. I was worried that around seven hours of cards for a documentary, average documentary shoot, would cost me around 7,000 pounds. All these things worried me, and that's why I, it wasn't on my radar. So lots of concerns. To be, you know, you have to be worried about these things. And again, not interested in 4K, because I've messed around with 4K, and nobody ever took it. So it didn't make any sense to me. Any, anybody have any idea what changed my mind? It's very simple. Hmm? Yeah, somebody gave it to me. Here's the camera. Now talk about it. it was, you know, they, they gave me a brown envelope with money, and they said, no, don't be silly. It's something much simpler than that. I tried it. It's the same. You'd read specs and you go, nah. I read the specs of the C300 and went, sounds really underwhelming. I, oh, that's better. I used it, fell in love with it. 1DC, I went, eh. Tried it, I went, oh, shit. It's really nice. I mean, it's really, the image is just wonderful. Now, 4K um, is rather large. Four times the resolution of 2K. And obviously, uh, a little bit bigger. The 2K is a little bit bigger than 1080p. So we're looking at a much, much, much bigger image, which means more resolution, more detail. And now, in one of the fiction people, actually, I, I lie, I had one film that was edited in 4K, but he can make a 4K master, but we've only ever done a 2K, and that was a fiction piece. And we used the 4K for reframing, because there was one, sh there's a couple of scenes where our actor was way more powerful in a wider shot than when we went in for a close-up, and we re-cropped. If he ever goes to a 4K master, though, I don't know what he's going to do. I'll have to upscale it. Extra resolution is really wonderful. Just to show you that what we get by punching in, if we just kill the lights a little bit, this is a frame from Miami, and this is on the uh, 5D Mark III, which is a lovely image. Now, this has not been post-sharpened. I always recommend post-sharpening the Mark III. It brings it to life. So this is it. Um, you're also going to see a, a different size in frame, because this is full frame, and the 1DC is a slight crop. Punching in 100%. Now, um, I know you know what that sign says, those two red signs, but you can't read it, right? And this is it times four. Okay, it's pretty soft, right? Would you use that? No. no. In film, you could easily get away with that. It will look grainy as hell, but you could do it. If you did that on you know, other cameras, let's have a look, see what happens on 1DC. This is a 1DC. You can already read that writing there. Times two. Very clear. I'm actually focused on infinity, so he's going to look slightly soft. He's obviously wondering what the hell is he doing. And there we go, times four. Pretty damn good. This is one of the key things, is that ability to have this incredible detail. So I'm going to play my first 4K clip. Um, this is called 576 megapixels. 
I tried to come up with silly names or less, in, less boring names, and I got that by Googling what an eye sees. And apparently, if you look around in your peripheral vision, you effectively they've measured it as 576 megapixels. It's probably nonsense, because I think it was on Wikipedia, but hey, it's good enough for a title. And we're going to play that for you now. Um, hopefully you enjoy it. And the detail on this is just, I think, exceptional. <laughs> Anybody who um, laughs the loudest or cheers the loudest, loudest after any clip or any joke will be winning the 1DC at the end. I will be taking decibel levels from here, so just to let you know that. Uh, that may not be true. Um, in an ideal world, we'll be seeing this on a 60-foot screen, and it, the detail is essential. So all I'm going to do is to show you how good that detail is. I'm actually just going to just kill the lights a little bit, please. So this is a frame from um, Nicola, who was at the workshop I took. Why is he looking so bloodshot? Is because I made them edit a film after the workshop, and they're up to like three or four in the morning doing it. Yes, I am a slave driver, but the piece that he made was really nice. So that is at, obviously this is um, not 4K from the computer, but you'll get an idea of what this is. So this is 100%, this is times two. This is times four, this is times eight, times 16. I mean, that's a little bit too much because you can see it all break up. But it shows you the amount of detail that you can get. I mean, look at that. It's just ridiculous. This shows you, again, the resolution and the detail. Um, now, I'm going to play a little bit of a, um, a documentary. We're going to keep the level down on this. You can kill the lights on this. Um, I can't play it all because it's a bit long, and we've only got 45 minutes. But most of my work is documentary, and I want to look, see. I'm on the ground again. <laughs> I'm always lying, and you know what? This was probably not the best place to be lying on the ground. That's ice and snow, and I tend to wear. Actually, these are better, but most of my jeans are a bit bros, and so they have. Hold, some of you know what bros is. Other ones would be like probably were born after bros came around, and so I went out. This is actually I was staying at my friend uh, Eric Kessler's house in Indiana. He lives on the lake. And that's um, frozen lake. So I was filming. I just I just wanted to go and shoot something. Just to, I always test the camera out fully before I take it on a professional job. So this was because I wanted to shoot docs. I wanted to see can I shoot a doc on this. So I went out for just one hour to shoot this. Very small um, amount of gear. I had uh, one tripod. I had my man bag um, with the camera in two lenses. And Eric held a Roland R26. Recorder with a Rode microphone, and that was our kit. Went out for an hour, tried to find a story, found some people, talked to them. So I'm going to play this um, with the, the, the level down, and just so we can see the images, please. And I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about this. So um, 
Four inches of ice is actually um, the minimum amount of ice before you should possibly think about walking on ice. Hence that title. Can we bring the, the audio down a little bit? Two years now. Obviously, 4K is incredibly unforgiving when it comes to focus, and you'll see that when I lose focus a few times. And it's obviously harder with the DSLR because you don't have these things like peaking and stuff like that. But you do have external monitoring, so you can use a monitor. I didn't take one. On every other shoot, the professional shoot I'm going to show you next, we did have a proper external monitor, which meant we were able to get perfect focus. Now, those snow shots sum up what I love about this camera so much. I filmed this on the first day I was there, and then the weather changed. It was minus 10 degrees centigrade, and then two days later, it was 22 degrees centigrade, which kind of screwed up my plans, because the ice started to melt, and I needed snow shots, just some snow shots. And I was only there for five days, and on the day before I was supposed to fly to Miami, I, the weather said it should snow tonight. I'm like, I need snow shots. I need snow. Hello, how are you? We met before, haven't we? Yeah, anyway. Um, I took out the camera in my man bag, one lens, my Gitzo tripod for dinner. So I went out for dinner, uh, waiting for it to snow. So I, you know, I have a 4K shooting kit on me in a little bag. And Eric, as my state came, Eric said, look, it's snowing, get out there. So I ran out there, got the snow shots, and I was sorted. And I can't imagine any other 4K camera that I would have used to have done that. If I'd taken another one, I'd have gone out for dinner with a couple of pedicases, a large tripod, and like, anywhere I can store this stuff here? And then the snow would have gone out there, I would have poured everything, poured it all together, and like, okay, ready to do this, and the snow would have stopped. It's a DSLR, I whipped it out, Put on a tripod, filmed it, bang, got the shots. So, honestly, it was an absolute piece of cake shooting this. Knocked it off within an hour. I mean, the only thing, obviously, is the fact that uh, data is, is more than, than other stuff for documentaries. So if you're shooting a big documentary where you're shooting interviews that last two hours or so, just be prepared for a lot of um, data wrangling. So anyway, we, we're, we'll come off that just because I just need to move forward. Thank you. And you can see all of these pieces except the music video you're about to see and the montage and the DSLR edit, actually most of it, on my website. Uh, the music video you're going to see in a minute will be on the website in about a month, uh, a week, two weeks' time. So the next thing I shot, I didn't go underwater. I filmed this from outside on a 100mm macro lens. So some of the shots will be a little bit softer than others because the glass is like, I don't know, like two inches thick or whatever it is, a fish tank is a little bit dirty, so some of the shots look cleaner because I'm going straight through. Anytime I'm angling up or down, it looks a little bit soft. On the wide shots, you'll see the real detail. So we'll just play this clip for you now.
And um, Eric said it looks better there than it does looking at it for real. I actually shot a 30 minute wide shot, which he can put on his, his TV, um, which is a lot less work than keeping it going because it requires like an hour and a half's worth of work each day to keep that tank running. Uh, but it's just, it's just, the detail is beautiful. You can see it much more in the wider shots, obviously. And it's a shame, in an ideal world, if there's less of you, I'd just get you in a line and you just walk up and just have a look at it here. But you can download both the uh, eyepiece and this piece in 4K from Vimeo, from my Vimeo page, vimeo.com, Philip Bloom. It is compressed, obviously, because the original files are 25 gigs. Um, it's compressed from 460 megabytes, megabits a second down to uh, around 80 or 90. So it's still fairly large size, but it, have a look at it, see the detail. Now, once I've done these fun pieces, time to do a pro gig, a music video with Ollie, and um, a little bit of a high, sort of like a concept piece. Um, it was a perfect camera for us because we needed to do guerrilla filming. 4K guerrilla filming? Yeah, why not? 1DC, no problem. And that was on the tube. We just went on there and did loads of nice shots. And also, we need that ability to tweak our framing because you'll see it in the piece. Ollie doesn't change position in the entire film or music video. It's the only time we ever use the word video, generally, is when we talk about music video. Every, everything else would potentially say, my film. But when it comes to music videos, it's my music video. You never say music film, do you? Hmm. It's really strange, actually. Anyway, I'm going to play this now. This is not finished. So this is, this was, we shot this Wednesday and Thursday. I did a very quick edit on Friday to manage to get the DCPs done in time for BBE. So just if there's a couple of moments where it's out of sync or you don't think the grade's quite right or something else, it's purely down to the fact it's not polished. I've got Foley to add and loads of other things, but it will be out by the end of next week. So we'll just play this clip here, Bitten by the Frost.
It's a cheery little video uh, about the mundane monotony of our lives with slight ways of you deviating into perhaps darker places and stuff. Anyway, querying, wondering why there's a guy looking at his, uh, his doodle in the toilet. He's from the band called Turing Breaks, and that's, this is his solo song, and that's his, his singing partner, band member. So it's like a little cameo. It's a nod to the fans. And so I did two different versions. I did one where he looked down and laughed, and I did another one where I get him to look down, and then look down, and then look down, and then look down, and look down. <laughs> I thought it was, it's a little bit too egotistical to put it in Ollie's video to have that. I thought it's funnier to actually make fun of it. Anyway, so this was all cut on the laptop, proxies, then relinked 4K, rendered out. Actually, it wasn't that hard. Um, I thought it would be much harder. So all cut within Premiere, wasn't too much wrong. I did try and cut the native 4K, it just crashed every like 10 minutes, so don't bother with that. Moving on very quickly, because we don't have that much time. Frame grabs and video is one of the key features about it. Uh, just kill the light slightly. This is video um, of Guy Thatcher, and Guy Thatcher turning into a, a JPEG of Guy Thatcher. Not a lot of difference, is there? There is very little difference. It is a, just slightly smaller than a medium JPEG. And the cool thing is, I know some people here shoot events and things like that. Wouldn't it be cool to just shoot video and then take frame grabs? Uh, I know somebody in Australia who did just that and created a beautiful photo book. So the ability to take frames and video is cool. Obviously, that one of the biggest problems we can have is shutter speed. Normally, you're taking stills, your shutter speed is higher. If you're shooting at a 50th of a second, which is what you shoot for video for 25p, you're going to get motion blur unless things are static. So there's always that sort of compromise. Um, not as good as large raw, of course, but definitely good enough for A3 prints because I saw them out there. Great for, you know, say doing multimedia. I think multimedia, that was the phrase I was looking for really, multimedia. So quickly, how do I feel about the camera now? Um, it is the most fully featured DSLR ever. It's got um, a wonderful 4K mode. Super 35 crop looks like the C300 because it's got Canon log in it, which is wonderful. It's got the full frame image of the 1DX, which I already love. It's got clean HDMI output. And when you shoot 4K, even if it's for HD, you scale it down, it just looks stunning. So this is why I'm going to start shooting 4K. I'll have 4K rushes, but I most likely will shoot 4K for HD. So I uh, just need to skip before, so we're a little bit behind. So the image is stunning. And this is it. It's recaptured. I'm filming everything with it. It's like having a 5D Mark II again. I just love shooting with it. And it's small. It goes in my man bag. And that is absolutely key. And I bought one. Um, that kind of sums up how much I liked it. I upgraded my 1DX and I bought it. So I just think it's an absolutely brilliant camera. Love it to bits. Right, I think we're pretty much out of time. Oh, that's really weird. I should be there. So I'm going to show, um, I'm, going to add, I'm going to play this. I think it's the best way I can do this. I'm going to play this montage and I'm going to take questions at the same time. Do you think that's possible? <laughs> Why the hell not? Because we are running out of time. So if you guys can um, kill the lights which means the girls with the microphones are going to hopefully have great low light vision. Eat your carrots, it doesn't actually work. And take some questions. This is a montage from Miami, Dubai, Brussels, and in England. I bet you'll struggle to pick out the England shots. Um, OK, we'll play that, and we'll get some questions. Any questions? Yes, Scott. Yeah, you can play this if we just bring the lights down. Uh, there's a lot of um, talk here whether 4K is the way to go or higher film rates, no, uh, good God, frame no. rates. Are, Don't are touch the way high to go. frame rates. It looks like cheap TV. Anybody here saw The Hobbit? Um, I, I hated it. I had to walk out. For everything, sports. Oh, for sports, video? different now. I mean, interlace hmm. has a place without a doubt, but it's not film. Look, The Hobbit at 48 frames per second didn't look like film, as far as I'm concerned. I'd rather have resolution than high frame rates. And also, there's you know, it depends who you listen to. Our eyes actually can't see past 60 frames per second. And I hear people talking about shooting even higher than that. It just doesn't look right. I think, it's, I think it's, it comes from a generational thing. You talk to kids who are playing Xbox games, everything is 60p. They see The Hobbit and they love it. I think our generation, uh, we like film look. And it isn't film look. What about the uh, storage? VF storage? Do you have to use the highest storage? You need UDMA 7 and 1,000 times speed. Very expensive, unfortunately. You, yeah, you can shoot stills with it. Um, Have you had any play with that? Have you uh, played with animating the stills? Animating the stills. Because I have the 1DC, I mean the 1DX. It takes exactly the same stills as the 1DX. Yeah. Identical. I've, I've been playing a little bit with taking like 100 frame clips, like say models down a catwalk or something. Yeah, like you that. could do it. I, I mean, it's more stop motion y, really. Yeah. But no, I don't you really need to. Is there any way to de stop motion that look? 
uh, get them to shoot 24 frames per second raw photographs. <laughs> exactly. That's a f not, I don't think that's a firmware fix. I think that's a mechanical fix. Exactly. Anybody else? How much is it? The camera, uh, it's like, I think it's like 8,800, so it's a fairly expensive camera. So, yeah, unfortunately. Oh, you don't get a lens with that. Though. No. You, get, you get a battery in the charger and a body cap. And if you want really low light sensitivity, you just take the body cap off. It is actually really good in low light. I've shot up 6400 and it looks great in 4K. If you shoot in HD, you can push it way higher. So, any other questions? I use 24 to 105 when shooting handheld because it has IS and has a decent range for me. Uh, Canon needs to make a 24 to 70 with IS, it's f2.8, and then I'll be happy. 24 to 105 isn't super, super, super sharp, but it's sharp enough for most of my handheld dock work. But if it's handheld, it doesn't need to be as sharp anyway, because you're moving. IS is essential with a DSLR, because it takes away, it's less about the rolling shutter, it is about the rolling shutter, it's that, it's that fine vibration that it removes, that's the key thing. How does it compare with the uh, 500 from Canon? C500 is a much more expensive camera. It's a professional video camera, but it becomes big. You can put the lights up, I think it's the last shot. It's, um, it requires an external recorder, which therefore would not fit into my man bag. Um, and that's the key Oops. thing for me. Now, if I was shooting a, a big gig, a film, then yeah, of course, that makes way more sense. Better codec, better image, effectively, less uh, issues in post. Um, it's a different camera. This has a, a specific place in, in the market, I would say, and it's unique. The multimedia aspect of it is unique. The image when you shoot 4K and downscale it is beautiful. It operates like a DSLR. It's weather sealed. Huge, huge plus. As long as you have a, a, a lens with a, you know, a, rub, a rubber stop, a rubber sort of like thingy on it. I got rained on, snowed on, everything, and I don't worry about it. A drop of rain falls from the sky with my C300 and I run, uh, you know, run away undercover as fast as possible. So yeah, uh, uh, the question there. Oh, yeah. Are you yeah. actually going to give up on the um, Mark III? Uh, no, I, uh, well, I'm going to use it as a B camera, perhaps, if I'm shooting this as a, a, an A camera. But if I'm using a C200 as an A camera, then this is my B camera. I'm not going to give up with it, because I still shoot a lot of time lapse as well. And it's a backup camera. So we're using the Dubai? Dubai, I, I use, yeah, I don't use my Mark. I, I actually would, I'm actually kind of reluctant to use my 1DC for time lapse. I know it's got huge shutter actuations, but I just feel it's an almost 9,000 pound camera. And I don't want to you know, tie it up and break it. Yep. Oh, I just want just to ask, when you, it's me here. Yeah. Where am I looking? Hello. Hey, hey. So when you say you shoot in the handheld, yeah? Because you, your, your shots look very steady. So how, what would you, where you say handheld, then how do you? The handheld, well, none of the 1DC stuff was handheld that you saw, but you saw some of the Mark, the 1DX, mm -hmm. IS. Yeah. IS and relax your body. Uh, as soon as you try and tense up, no good. You've got to relax your body. Don't drink too much coffee, <coughs> which is a big mistake of mine. Um, yeah, IS makes the world of difference. And it's great that Canon started bringing out some prime lenses with IS. In fact, one of my favorite new lenses is the 35 F2 IS. It's not an L-series, and I might put a little rubber O-ring on it, see if I can make it a bit more weather-sealed. Try it. Um, I won't try it with my camera, I'll get a rental. But you said um, the, oh, big pardon. You but said yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's, who was asking? The handheld, that's really it. A rig, a simple rig. I use a very little Zakuto rig, a Z Finder, and that's it. I don't bother with these big things. No interest. Uh, Philip, you said, you said the um, 1DC fell beneath broadcast specs. How does the 1DX compare? It's, it's, it's just not been approved for 100% acquisition. And that comes down to Alan Roberts. And I've got to, I've got to wind up, and he's just done this, or is this like you know, some sort of dance move like in Saturday Night Fever? OK, I'm going to have to take two more questions, but you will see me down at the Canon stand. I can answer as many more. Hi, um, I'm just going to ask. You've already had like three. I haven't. Yeah. This is my first one. I'm not you, Ian. <laughs> yeah. Make it quick, um, then I can do thanks. two more. Yeah, sorry. Um, do you use a, a, a stabilizing software for any of the sort of handheld stuff in post? No. No. No, I, uh, maybe, no, on two shots in this Safari dock in the 1DX, I did, I used warp stabilizer in, in, in uh, Premiere. But I try to keep it steady. I, I'm, a, I'm an old-fashioned cameraman in that I try to get everything in, in camera, whether it's filters, um, exposure, everything. Yeah. What, what kind of advice would you like to give to the new filmmakers, the new DPs, actually? Come talk to me downstairs. 
Uh, seriously, come to me downstairs, I'll give you, uh, it's a longer question, longer answer. Last question. Yeah, any problems with overheating? With overheating? Yeah. Uh, no, but we did have this, th we had a thermometer warming com warning come up once briefly on the music video on day two. No reason for it, nothing happened, but it seems fine. Uh, but I've not taken it to extreme places. If, if anybody here wants to send me to somewhere really, really hot, I'm more than happy to go and test it out for you. you have you gone for a I've not done any long recordings. That's probably a good test, is if I just hit, because there's no record limit, no 29.59, because it's, that's part of the reason why it's more expensive, because it's taxed higher as a video camera. I could just let it record longer, except I don't have a card longer than 128, bigger than that. So anyway, any more questions, just see me downstairs. I know I'm 45 minutes is so tight to get everything in. My email address, um, you'll get replied quicker. 1DC uh, in the title. Twitter, I'm always replying to unless I'm actually working. That's my website. And if you're interested in actually talking more leisurely, even after this, we're going to be at the Fox Pub <laughs> next door from 6.30. Everybody's welcome. And please don't all buy me a drink. Otherwise, I won't be doing another talk tomorrow. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming. I hope I've managed to give you some information. <laughs>